circumnavigated the ent- we circumnavigated the entire island and saw many of the hot sp- the, the points of interest, including the cliffs of Moor. Yeah. We kissed the Blarney Stone, saw many of the cities. <clears throat> took a took a trip, uh, a boat trip in the uh, Bay of Galway, and just uh, saw Belfast and the Titanic Museum. It was a wonderful trip. So these are also available to uh, to members of LLI. So I'll, uh, before I turn it over to Steve, I'll just urge everybody, uh, if you're interested in travel, if you're interested in these continuing education classes, interested in special interest groups, I didn't mention some of our special interest groups include a bridge club, a photography club, a book club, a mystery book club, a tabletop game club, uh, and a foodies and friends. And we have a financial discussion <laughs> Uh, special interest group, but it's temporarily inactive as we lost our leader. But uh, all of these groups, access to them, generally they meet once a month, are also available to LLI members. So if you are interested, uh, please check us out at llinova.org. We've got a very uh, simple to navigate website, and I think you'll find lots and lots of services, lots of programs of interest. And the fee, again, is only $110 a year, and that includes everything but, you know, the travel and I think a couple of our cooking classes, there might be an extra $5 or $10 fee. But uh, I call it the best deal in town, and uh, I hope uh, some of the our AARP guests will take a look at us. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to Steve for the introduction of our speaker. Thank you, Derek. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you have questions during the following discussion, please put them in the chat box. Uh, Joanne will be uh, monitoring that. Uh, there is also a survey uh, that uh, we'd like you to fill out at the end of the, uh, the meeting for AARP. Uh, it's, we put it in the chat box and we'll put it in again at the end of the meeting. Our panel today is from the Brain Injury Hope Foundation, Colorado. <laughs> Co-founder Dr. Marianne Keatley, a speech language pathologist, will be interviewed by Joanne Cohen, who is a certified brain injury specialist. Their discussion will include the latest research on cognitive mental issues, including fatigue, sleep disorders, long haul COVID, and its impact on our brains, improving our memories, speed of processing, word retrieval, and other brain issues. And with that, I'll turn it over to our, our speakers. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, all 136 of you that are here today. We're really excited about bringing this topic to you. It's something that's pertinent, and you're in for a real treat with Dr. Mary Ann Keatley. Uh, she has been a colleague and friend for many, many years, and we're on the board of directors, as Steve said, for the Brain Injury Hope Foundation that she founded 25 years ago. Um, what we do is we give emergency funds for people with brain injury here in Colorado, as well as provide a survivor series monthly um, that's grant funded and donation funded that any of you could attend. Uh, we do this the second Friday of the month. So mm-hmm. if any of you are interested, you can put your uh, contact information in the chat and uh, we can get you on our contact list. So with that, I am going to share the screen now and um, introduce you to uh, Dr. Marianne Keatley. In fact, Marianne, I'm going to have you introduce yourself given your background and why you're passionate about the brain and this work. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. You're Hi, welcome. everybody. Um, well, I've been a speech language pathologist for over 40 years, more like about 45 years. And I started out uh, working in hospitals for a number of years. And um, I learned a lot about the brain, about cognitive retraining, about uh, rehabilitating the brain. And as I've aged, along with all of us, uh, I got more interested in the aging brain. Uh, So I've developed a lot of information and tools to use with the aging brain. Um, I became passionate because I was seeing so many patients that had mild traumatic brain injuries. I mean, all the way to severe, but, but it was interesting to me how a lot of those folks couldn't really get back to work. They were losing their homes, their jobs, their families. And I realized that we needed a foundation to actually support those people through the beginning phase of the injury, because what they all say is, I look fine. 
But just because you look fine doesn't mean that you aren't dealing with something neurological. And so that's how I got interested. And also with all the latest research and all the new neuroimaging uh, pieces of equipment, we can do a lot more now for individuals. So that's that's the story, Joanne. Thanks, Marianne. And there's a slide up here now. We just want to recommend Marianne's going to give you lots of different information and tools. And we recommend that you consult your physician for all medical advice. And we are not here to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So we're not verified, nor do we condone any opinions or recommendations contained herein and not responsible or liable uh, related to this. However, um, with that being said, we're going to move on to the first question or the second question, actually, Marianne, and that's, can you describe how brainwave frequencies and different areas of the brain affect our functioning in various states? Sure. Uh, so brainwave frequencies, we all know, we think about the brain as just a little physical object that's up there that you know, runs everything in our body, basically. But underneath that also our brainwave frequencies, we have a whole electrical system in our body. And I like to think of it a little bit like a radio dial. If you're listening to a program that's, let's say, at 100 hertz, your dial is kind of down here. But if you move ahead and move to 1490 or one of those stations, your brain is it's moving up in frequency. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, delta is actually the sleep wave that we produce. And it's about two to four hertz. And as we fall into sleep, we move through theta, which is just above it, which is about four to seven hertz. And that's the state between wakefulness and sleep. So when you're going to sleep at night and you're just beginning to drift off, that's when you're in theta waves. And that also occurs when you wake up in the morning. It's a very creative state. And so many people who are highly creative, like artists and authors and folks like that, a lot of times spend a lot of time in a theta frequency. Above theta is alpha. And that's um, a state that occurs when your eyes are closed and you're thinking or you're reading. It's alpha also they've found over the years they've studied meditating and found that alpha actually uh, is the state you're primarily in at eight to 12 hertz if you're meditating. Above alpha is beta, and that's when you're really into focus, concentration, and attention. And so like if you're paying your bills or paying attention to a lecture like today, hopefully you'll be a little bit more in alpha or beta. Uh, and this is just important because you can actually alter your own brainwave frequencies once you're aware of it. And that's part of what I wanna make clear during this lecture. Okay, next slide, Joanne. Okay, this is just a little picture that shows, okay, the, the kind of the shape of the waves. But the only thing I think that's really important about this is if you look at the delta wave, it's kind of smooth and moves along in a certain way. But as you get move up into beta, you get very irregular brainwave frequencies. They look very jaggedy kind of, and that's what's normal. So um, keep that in mind. All right, next slide. The next slide is really shows you the areas of the brain. And I know probably everybody's yawning about now about this, but we're going to talk briefly because this affects the exercises you do to stimulate your brain. So if you look over here at the slide that says anatomy of the brain, the, the frontal lobe is the prefrontal cortex part of the brain. That is problem solving, planning, decision making, prioritizing, all of those really important things that we do to, to run our lives. Um, right behind it is the parietal lobe. That's kind of like a lavenderish color. And that's, the, that's a sensory area with sensations that are coming in from the outside that monitors that, like touch, taste, feel. Um, right below the parietal area is your temporal lobe, the green one. And that actually is speech, um, uh, hearing, and thinking of words, things that are very critical to our lives occur in the temporal lobe. 
right behind the temporal lobe is the occipital lobe, and that's the visual cortex of the brain. And we all know how important vision is. And sometimes we have to work on our vision, particularly if we've had a brain injury or something like that, you have to really repair things that go wrong, like, you know, converging the eyes or diverging them or tracking information. Uh, and as we age, we realize that visually, sometimes we really have to work on that skill. Okay, if you look over here at, this, at the, the other slide on brains, there's only one thing I wanna talk about here. And that is, um, this is the right side of the brain and you can see the sensory cortex that does sensory functioning in the pink area. And you can see the motor cortex in the yellow area. This is kind of critical because you can see how at the top of your brain, are, it says hip, trunk, neck, arms as you go down, but at the very top are your toes and your legs, toes, feet, legs, and so that's controlled at the top of your brain, whereas your fingers, your hand, and your face are controlled more down toward the temporal lobe here. And that's important because when you're rehabilitating following, say, for example, a stroke or a brain injury, you can use the information from this to um, repair some of those skills. All righty. So Marianne, can you talk a little about neuroplasty and how the brain changes over time? Sure. Neuroplasticity is a very important concept in brain rehabilitation. And for those of us that are aging, we want to keep our brains young and flexible and moving along. Um, we didn't, a number of years ago, we didn't really know about neuroplasticity, but it's become very popular. And to, to sort of put this in perspective, when I first started working in the 70s, mid 70s, I was working at, at hospitals in Denver, and we didn't even have CAT scanners. They weren't even really around at that point in time. So like a physician may come and say, okay, you've seen this patient, they have this particular speech problem, where would the tumor be? And so we were having to like, you know, try to help them figure out where they were gonna start if they were gonna be doing a surgical procedure. Um, and I think it's amazing how far we've come in terms of information. And that's how we know about neuroplasticity. So changes occur in all the different kinds of brain cells, the neural, neurons, the glial cells, all the vascular cells. And during the first few years of life, the neurons mature and they send out branches and the outgoing branches are called the axons and the incoming branches are called your dendrites. I think about it kind of like a tree, you know, a little, a, a little tree. And <clears throat> these uh, particular branches increase, increase in the number of synaptic responses that they have. So as we grow old, this is, this is sort of a pearl of wisdom, I think. As we grow old, we actually go through something called synaptic pruning. I guess that's why I think about it like a tree. The brain actually prunes off synapses that we are, are no longer using, <clears throat> excuse me, and it strengthens the stronger ones. So that's a really uh, critical concept. Um, Posit Science, that's a company that has existed for a long time, did a big study called the Impact Study many years ago, actually. And they did, they were some of the first people to do brain fitness exercises. And they had people do six different exercises, <clears throat> excuse me, for a total of 40 hours over time. And what they discovered is that people's memory improved by 10 years because they did objective testing after that and their speed of processing improved by 131%. I mean, that's a huge improvement by doing exercises. And an, another little pearl of wisdom here, besides the fact that, you know, we have many, many synapses, some get pruned away, some stay, is that my experience over almost 50 years shows me that speed of processing is really one of the very most important things to improve in brain functioning. All righty, let's move on. Um, as far as comparison studies, they've done many studies. 
looking at some 27 year olds versus 87 year olds and 40 year olds versus uh, 70 year olds. Um, what they find is that the like the hippocampus is the memory center of the brain, basically, although they're discovering memories all over the brain, really. Um, but there is cell loss, even with healthy aging. But what they've discovered is that it doesn't necessarily affect memory at all. You may not lose your memory at all, even if you're losing cells. And so we all, as we age, lose approximately 5% per decade of cells after the age of 40, uh, and particularly after the age of 70. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's kind of an important thing. What, one of the studies I read more recently that was very interesting is that they found that if people keep up with brain games, I'll call them games, but they're really more like therapeutic programs, that one fifth of the people that were 70 or older could perform all the same cognitive tasks with the same speed as 20 year olds. So that, that gives you a, an important thing to strive for really. Um, the National Institute of Health did a study in 2020, and what they found is um, they included hyperbaric oxygen treatments, which are now becoming more and more popular over time, but they looked at Alzheimer's disease and using what's called HBOT. And they discovered that if people did, I believe, 45 sessions, no, 40 minutes of hyperbaric oxygen for 20 days, that it significantly improved people's functioning on objective testing. And then they looked at it one month and three months later and discovered that the individuals with Alzheimer's disease were significantly improved. So that's a that's sort of a newer thing that I think is gonna be coming up in our, you know, over time. All righty. Thanks, Marianne. That gives us some hope and there's some things that we can do. And I know you're going to be talking about more of what we can do shortly. Um, let's talk about COVID. Uh, I'm aware that COVID might cause neurological problems related to long hauler syndrome. Many of us here, including myself, have had COVID. Can you talk about the symptoms and the triggers and the neurological complications and treatments for COVID-related symptoms? Sure, let's spend a little bit of time on this because COVID is very prevalent in everybody's minds about now. And I actually got it this year for the first time. I thought it was gonna be one of those people that would never get it. But, you know, I don't know. I think there's new strains that come out and uh, whatever, but we'll talk about that. So if you have coronavirus, COVID-19, that lasts for one to three months after you tested negative and you have symptoms, then you would be diagnosed with long hauler syndrome. And the Brookings Institute did, has done a number of studies over time, and this one is from 2022. But they, they found that there's over 100 million Americans that are out of work now due to long COVID. And over 500 million people were infected in the pandemic. And those are just sort of numbers to us. But I saw a young physician about a year ago who got COVID before the vaccines came out. He was he's less than 40, maybe 36. And um, he is so fatigued that he can't go back to work. And his wife is, is uh, very on the ball and has tried every treatment. He found that hyperbaric oxygen therapy helped him, but he, and he's getting slowly better. And she writes me about every six months but he still hasn't gotten well enough to return to work, but they're hoping he will. Some of the most common symptoms with long COVID are fatigue, which occurs in about 82% of people, brain fog in 67%, uh, headaches, 60%, sleep disturbance, uh, depression in about 28% because they've been so isolated as part of it and they've probably had biochemical changes. Um, anxiety is a little less, 19%, and dizziness, 54%. And I've seen a number of clients who have had dizziness um, after their vaccines, but eventually that seems to have resolved for a lot of people. You can also have shortness of breath, joint pain, 
A loss of sense of taste and smell, which you also can get in mild traumatic brain injury, and memory and concentration problems occur, you know, a, a significant amount of the time. So triggers of these symptoms include, and this is really interesting. Okay, so let's say you've had COVID and you've gotten through the initial phase and you have some long COVID, um, but you notice that sometimes you feel really well and other times you really have a lot of, of symptoms that occur. So you, of course, are trying to connect the dots. What causes the symptoms? And what they've found is that a lot of physical activity, like going out for a long hike or something, or doing mental activities, like balancing your checkbook, uh, making lists, doing things like that can cause fatigue and symptoms. Um, it's the symptoms are worsened by stress, by dehydration, not drinking enough fluids, weather changes. And this one really jumped out at me because in traumatic brain injury um, and strokes, people don't realize it so much except changes in the weather really can initiate a symptom. And so as the barometer drops, the tissues in the body swell many times. So if you have arthritis or if you have asthma, the tissues may swell in your lungs and you may find that you're having more breathing problems. Well, that's what they're finding in uh, COVID. Europe actually has a program I noticed a number of years ago called Envirozine. And so at night or during the day when they do the weather, they tell you about the barometric pressure so you can make adjustments for your day. Um, consuming large meals. Um, I've had people report to me who have had COVID that they can no longer eat a large amount of food at a time. I've also seen this with carbon monoxide poisoning. They've had to reduce the size of their meals. Also, alcohol consumption will affect the triggering of symptoms with COVID. So the neurological implication of COVID, and we were waiting and waiting to see when they were actually going to say this, is that it is a neurological problem. It creates damage to the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So, um, I mean, that sounds really ominous, but, you know, in neurological rehabilitation, we've spent many years rehabilitating the nervous systems, both central and peripheral, and people make huge gains. So don't give up on that if you've had it and have symptoms. The other thing that's really important is that MRI studies are negative a lot of times. So you may go to your, your doctor and you have all these symptoms and eventually they send you for an MRI and the MRI is normal. Then you begin to think, well, what's the deal? Did I really have this or not? We see that all the time in brain injury because MRIs are frequently normal in mild and moderate traumatic brain injury. Um, but they're, they're starting to have a real deep understanding of, of these types of problems. So if you have lasting symptoms, you should look at all kinds of diagnostic things like your C-reactive proteins, get your doctor to test that. Um, also, you know, pituitary functioning and, and different, different things that your physician can look at. As far as treatments go, Paxlovid has been one of the most popular treatments, and I did take it after I had COVID recently, and then I had a rebound effect, of course, which I didn't mind too much because it got me out of the initial symptoms quite rapidly within two to three days. And so I think if you, if you get COVID, if you're diagnosed with it, really think about you know calling your physician or deciding if you're going to take Paxlovid. You can also do intravenous monoclonal antibody treatments, which are IV treatments. And there's specifications for doing that. I think being a little older than 65, some of those things uh, will do it, but your physician can make a decision about that. Marianne, uh, there's a chat. Uh, what about abnormal PET scans? Um, I haven't read much on abnormal PET scans yet, but I'm sure that's going to be coming out. Most of the information I saw was on MRIs, but if anybody has any information, I'd love to know that. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move on and okay. talk about fatigue. And fatigue is a symptom that affects individuals who are aging and those who have suffered neurological injuries, such as strokes, traumatic brain injury, COVID, long haulers, as we just heard, 
Can you discuss this along with the types of fatigue and the new research from the Kessler Foundation? Sure. Uh, fatigue is a favorite topic, and Joanne and I have talked about this over time to a number of gro groups, and I've done some lectures to stroke groups as well, because that's a, a large symptom they have. But fatigue occurs for all kinds of reasons during neurological injuries. Um, the brain actually uses more energy than any other organ in the body. And I think we associate energy with physical tasks, but uh, mental tasks require a huge amount of energy. And once you understand that, you can start accommodating it and uh, work on improving your functioning. Um, when the brain gets injured, whatever the cause, whether it's strokes, brain injury, COVID, any, any one of those, or if we're just aging, um, if it's injured, it takes most of your energy just to do basic life functions like making breakfast, brushing your teeth, um, doing things like that. And a lot of times people don't, people in the environment who haven't had extreme fatigue don't quite understand that. And if there's actually an article called the spoon theory, that is a way that you can explain to people if you have fatigue, and I'm not going to go into it here, but it's, it's fun to read and think about using it. Um, in terms of mild traumatic brain injury, what they found is that 43 to 73% of the people uh, complain about mental fatigue, and they do this for sometimes several years post injury. And this fatigue can affect working capacity and the ability to go out and socialize with your friends, have lunch, do things like that. And I think that's what's happening with the COVID individuals a lot is that if 100 million people haven't been able to return to work, a lot of that, I think, is related to cognitive fatigue. Some of the people I've tested and worked with can do things just fine for a very brief period of time. But when the brain gets tired and shuts down, it's immediate. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, fatigue affects quality of life. And what the studies show, this has been studied over and over, and what the studies really show is that fatigue oftentimes occurs when people are trying to overcome attentional problems. Like somebody's talking to you like me, and you're listening, and you're really trying to listen. That may cause extreme fatigue. Also, if you're trying to process all the information I'm giving to you fairly quickly, that may cause fatigue. Um, so if, if you have fatigue, it's important to go to your doctor and have them take a look at your pituitary functioning. Like in brain injury, 25 to 50% of individuals with traumatic brain injury have pituitary problems. Okay, next slide. Miriam, before I go on to that, I just got a chat and uh, maybe we need to go back to the research about the monoclonal antibodies that are ineffective against the latest strains of COVID. Right. That's what the, uh, do you want to just address that for a second? Sure. I think the important thing with all of these, obviously, everybody's different. It was interesting. I read a, a quote that kind of addresses that. And this physician said, if you've seen one patient with COVID, you've seen one patient, rather than if you've seen one, you've seen them all, because everybody's symptoms are different. So as far as the monoclonal antibodies go and some of the new strains, you'd have to go to your doctor and really make sure that they determine which strain you've got and which treatment would work for you. Thank you. We'll go to the next slide now. Right. Okay, there's three types of fatigue. And there's one factor that I think is really interesting here, but physical fatigue is when you do things all day, clean your house, do your gardening, make your meals, all of that. Um, you become more fatigued over the day. And that's, that's a normal um, symptom unless you unless it occurs very quickly. Cognitive fatigue occurs when you're trying to solve problems or do something very efficiently. You may get tired or faster. But the one that I think is really interesting is that emotional fatigue. Um, many times people feel very fatigued if they're under stress or if they feel depressed. But this symptom usually is oftentimes worse when you wake up in the morning rather than as you go through the day farther and farther. So watch out for that one already, Joanna. 
the next slide, um, this is the good news about fatigue, is that several years ago, the Kessler Foundation did a number of studies. And what they found is that fatigue and traumatic brain injury occurs in the basal ganglia and the caudate nucleus. Nobody had ever really been able to figure out that before, but based on the studies they did, the imaging studies and things, they found that out. And so what the belief is, is that now that they understand where it is in the brain, that they're gonna be able to develop clinical interventions that are gonna help people actually get better. Um, one of the thoughts on fatigue that's sort of been thrown around over many years is that there's a glutamate buildup and glutamate is a neurotransmitter in the brain. And it's important in terms of memory, concentration and mood. And what they found is that, you know, glutamate buildup seems to be related somehow to fatigue, but they haven't quite uh, figured out yet how to use that as a treatment. All so right, let's move on to the energy allocation paradigm or model, which is one of my favorites and really helped me understand the difference between a healthy brain and a brain that's had a traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury, such as acquired brain injury is MS, Parkinson's, stroke, whatever. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this model. I think it really helps people understand uh, for example, when someone, when you say, I forget something and people say, well, I forget that too. Sometimes they discount uh, the person who is um, initiating and saying what's going on for them and it shuts them down. So let's talk about this. Right. Yeah. I know you love this little model. This was actually developed by a friend of mine uh, when we were working in the hospital and she tried to publish it. And nobody was interested and now everybody loves it. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people. Mm. So if you look at the healthy brain picture over here, um, as you can see, um, in a, in a pretty healthy brain, if you do physical demands during the day, it uses maybe a sixth of your energy. And if you do thinking and cognitive things, like, you know, some computerized programs or balancing your checkbook or writing a letter that takes maybe about a sixth of your energy too. emotional demands dealing with emotions that come up. Like, let's say you go to the grocery store and the clerk yells at you for no reason. And you have to kind of put it into perspective and think, well, they got up on the wrong side of the bed. Um, but, but it takes energy for the brain to do that. And if that happens, you're having to deal with it, but with a healthy brain, you go home and you maybe still have 50% of your reserve left. So you can call your friends, you can go to the movies, you can make dinner, you can do all of those kind of things without feeling extremely exhausted. But if you look at the TBI brain over here, you can see physical demands take a lot of energy and cognitive demands take at least a third of your energy to think. And then emotional demands take an amount. So what you've got is a small slice of the pie as a reserve. And I've had so many people over the years say, well, my friend and I made plans for dinner, but then I had to cancel and I've done it canceled three times and that person's angry with me. Well, maybe if we just sat down and explained to the friend that there's no reserve after you live through the day uh, to deal with it. What, what would you like to add, Joanne? Oh, I think that's great. And I think we say the TBI brain, but I think it's also the aging brain. Yes. And, and uh, I can say that um, I'm a TBI survivor myself and um, really felt for years, uh, as well as uh, the folks that I was supporting through the Brain Injury Hope Foundation, that um, people would shut us down when we would get absolutely exhausted and we'd lose things. We couldn't find things. We had speed of processing issues, whatever. And when I explained and showed this model to people, it was like a, a light bulb went off and people stopped with the, um, they're trying to lend support, but it really feels like a discount. So just know that as we have an aging brain, we have a TBI brain or an acquired brain injury, uh, um, if we start feeling we're, we're messing up our checkbooks, we're having issues and living our lives and, and we're feeling exhausted, a lot of cognitive fatigue, it's because we don't have the reserves that we had 
when we're younger, when our brain was healthier. And so there are things that we can do, and Marianne will be talking about this as we go down the road here, about what we can do to build up our reserves, but also it takes a lot of rest and also just um, embracing our brain wherever it's, it's at and not judging it at this point. Good. All yeah. right, should we look at what we can do to- Yeah, so here we go. Alrighty, so um, in order to compensate for decreased energy, um, we can sleep more at night, take more naps during the day. Also consider using morning blue light therapy. And that's something we'll talk more a little bit about, but that's coming into popularity now as far as trying to decrease fatigue. Pace yourself throughout the day. And this is something we always tell our clients, do a little bit, rest a little bit, do a little bit, rest a little bit, and use that model throughout the day to actually allow yourself to have energy by the end of the day. Um, also, analyze tasks. We have a tendency to think of things we have to do by time, like it takes, um, say, for example, an hour to do something. And yet, if we thought more about how much energy it takes, then we might alter our tasks. So say, for example, in a neurological disorder, it takes a huge amount of energy to go to the grocery store, something that you might have done easily before. But because of the fluorescent lights, all of the visual stimulation, all of the different kinds of foods and products and the sounds coming over the loudspeaker, um, there's a lot of things that really can make it hard to do tasks like that. So now obviously we can order food online, which is also helpful. But if you want to go in, you can do things like wear a baseball cap to decrease the fluorescent lights or take your sunglasses in there or wear your earplugs, something that will decrease that over stimulation of sound. Right. Marianne, we've got a couple chats here. Uh, one is, can you define traumatic brain injury versus other types of brain injury? You know, I mentioned Parkinson's and other diseases. Uh, this person said they're new to these terms. Sure, no problem. A traumatic brain injury is a brain injury where you actually um, whiplash the brain and the brain contacts the skull. So like if you fall and hit your head or you bump your head on a cupboard, um, or are, if you're rear-ended in a car accident, you may you know, have a traumatic brain injury. Other kinds of brain injuries are, that occur because of strokes. You may have a brain injury due to a brain tumor that's removed and maybe there's residual symptoms. Um, but there's, there's uh, the definitions get more and more specific as you go through. Um, and things like Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, those have other specific neurological um, causes that cause them. Like in Parkinson's, you may have some problems in the basal ganglia, which may cause problems with balance and things like that. It's really a form of brain injury, but has completely different symptoms than other things. Thank you. Um, so a couple of people have pointed out our numbers for the population. So about um, something's wrong with the population numbers, only about 300 million in the US, Canada 100 million out of work and 500 million affected. So we'll have to go back. And yeah, I'll go back to the original research I read on that. Okay. Yeah, because I took it straight out of the research. But as we know, research is only as good as whoever wrote it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks, though, for pointing that out. Sure. So the next uh, question I have for you, Marianne, is uh, what are some important uh, brain facts to recall as we age? Alrighty, so quickly we're gonna move through this. The, and most of you know a lot of these factors, but the human brain weighs three pounds, about, some people maybe more and some people less, and has 100 billion nerves or nerve cells. And this was uh, reported in a book by, I think, it, I think it's Richard Restack rather than Ricard, but I'm not sure. And he wrote a book called Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot. And it's a little book, but it's fascinating. He has all these little brain facts and then he has some exercises you can do. But um, the neurons in the cerebral cortex, um, 
that what they say is that there's a million billion synapses or neural connectors and it would take approximately 32 million years to actually count all of the synapses in a human brain if you did one per second. I mean, that's mind boggling to me. I can't even think about that. Um, the literature said that the 100 billion neurons are believed to be able to communicate with, neuro, with each other neuron. And so there's links that are only about two to three degrees of separation from each other. So the brain is forming linkages all the time that get stronger and stronger as you repeat activities and tasks. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, so there's a book by Eric Braverman called The Edge Effect that I thought was very interesting. And what he talks about, and I think this is so important for the aging brain really, and the, and the brain injured brain, the difference between a resourceful mind and senility is only 100 milliseconds of brain speed, which means that you have fewer than 100 milliseconds to lose over the course of your life. So that goes back to what I think is the, one of the most important things to keep all life, you know, brain functions going in that speed of processing. So the human brain processes light in about 50 milliseconds and it processes sound in about 100 milliseconds. And the book was called The Edge Effect, 100 milliseconds. And thinking occurs in about 300 milliseconds. So if that slows down to 400 milliseconds, you can no longer uh, process logical thoughts. So that's something we all really want to work on. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. Um, the important thing to remember is that Whatever you can see happen in a younger brain can happen in an older brain. So we can rehabilitate that skill if we work on it. Marianne, before we move on to the next slide, we have a question. What's the difference between blue light and white light therapy? I have and use a white light for SAD. Yeah, um, there, they, there's some differences in that. And I can't specifically tell you However, I've done some research on it and I can give you the names of some authors. So that's actually a little bit farther back in the presentation, but um, blue light therapy has to do with regulating sleep cycles. Whereas the white light therapy, I think has a lot to do with um, alertness, decreasing uh, SAD and things like that. So what's people, SAD? Um, seasonal affective disorder. Okay people who feel a little depressed in the fall or the winter months without much light. Like my son lived in Seattle for a number of years and he always had a white light next to his computer. So I think it's important to realize there's things out there that we can use. So even into our 70s, the brains produce new neurons. And that's a concept that didn't exist when I was first working. So like if someone had a stroke, a lot of times the physicians would say, okay, whatever you haven't regained in three months you can't regain but now they're really coming to understand that the brain does produce more neurons um, so the normal aging process leaves most mental functions intact unless you have some sort of disease process that causes things to change causes loss of nerve cells so Neurons remain healthy until you die, they say, unless you have another process going on. Hey. Right. Next, let's see what's on. So there. now that we have a concept of how the brain ages, let's talk about skills and exercises to help us maintain our active and youthful brain functioning. All right. So brain skills and exercises. This is my favorite part because I think it's, it's the most important for people who really want to activate their brain. So if you're working on keeping your brain really going, you want to um, work on all of these skills, flexibility of thinking, memory, language and word retrieval, speed of processing, logic and deductive reasoning, concentration, multi-tracking, auditory attention, visual skills. And you can do some of these very easily. Um, the Sharp Minds program by AARP is a, a great thing to do. And there's a number of other programs out there that I'm gonna talk about too. Um, as far as flexibility of thinking, you're trying to 
move your brain hemisphere to hemisphere back and forth so that it it stays you know flexible and one way to do that is like let's say you're out on a walk all you have to do is think about um putting something in your mind you don't have to say it out loud but like saying a1 like do the first letter of the alphabet and the first number a1 b2 c3 d4 e5 and that will keep the flexibility going or say start with a number like zero and then do the first month of the year january and the first day of the week monday so you have G zero january monday then you add three three february tuesday then you add three six march third or wednesday so you go through and you just make your brain think about things in sequence but do something flexibly now in terms of memory which is what most people really want to work on memory can be worked on specifically through a program called dual n back d-u-a-l hyphen n hyphen back dual means you're doing two things at once n is the number back that you're trying to remember something and so that program was studied well over the years we've all watched memory specifically because everyone wants to work on memory pretty much and Johns Hopkins finally really started studying memory and a few years ago they studied a number of programs and what they found was that dual and back was a program that increased memory by 30 percent in 30 days so if you did it every day and the, the beauty of it is it's very short you can do it in two to five minutes if you want to Marianne so, you said it's d-u-a-l yeah d-u-a-l hyphen hyphen and hyphen, hyphen back. back i just sent that to everybody yeah but add this joanne um it's it, you can go to your google bar online and type in brainscale.net and when you do that it's it's a free program that does dual and back so you can practice it online by going to brainscale.net there's a number of um programs yeah brainscale.net yeah you got it there's a number of programs that have dual and back like lumosity has it and probably a lot of you have done lumosity over time it's it's a great program it got some bad, bad press in the beginning because they hadn't done adequate research but now they've done that and they have a dual and back in their program too yeah lumosity there's a lot of programs there's well the sharp minds through aarp there's lumosity there's dual and back there's happy neuron and each of these programs have their own things there's also a program called brain hq and that was okay posit science that i read the impact study to you guys earlier is now called brain hq and it used to sell for like a thousand dollars i think that's why a lot of people weren't overly interested in doing it but now brain hq is very inexpensive uh, the thing I found with Brain HQ, however, is that you have to have really good visual processing speed. And sometimes those of us that have cataracts or have had cataract surgery, our vision doesn't work quite as fast. But if you work on dual and back, it works on memory, speed of processing, concentration and attention, and multi-tracking all at once. So that's that's um, sort of a plug for that one that we've seen. I've seen. Why, people, why is it that our eyes don't work as well if we've had cataract surgery, or our brain doesn't work as well? Well, I don't know that our brain doesn't work as well. It's hard to say, but I think it's something you can train, Joanne. But like sometimes our visual, like if we have cataracts and they're covering part of the eye, then you you maybe not you won't might not even see the visual stimuli that's mm -hmm. there so that you know that can be a an issue but a lot of things you can learn to compensate for so let's move to, let's look at language and word retrieval that's a very significant area that people talk a lot about and um derek yesterday said hey i'm banking on my crossword puzzles to really you know pull me through on this and I think that's true. I love crossword. You're probably doing Wordle and Dordle and all those things that are great. But 
the thing you need to do is increase your speed of word retrieval. And one way to do that is to each day or you know once or twice or three times a week, pick a letter of the alphabet, let's say S, and sit down and set your phone for one minute or your timer and write as many words as you can in one minute that start with the letter S, like soap, sap, sit, skill, some, you know, any, any word you can come up with, don't think about it too long, just make the word come up rapidly. If you can write down 12 to 20 words, you're in good shape, but that's, that's a big word retrieval ta task that works really great for speed of word retrieval. The other thing about word retrieval is a number of years ago, they, they did a study where they put people into PET scanners and they looked at what parts of speech actually increased blood flow and oxygen uptake in like the temporal lobe in the word area of the brain. What they discovered is that verbs did that. And it was such an important finding because we were always getting people to name nouns like, you know, lamp, picture, door, hinges, whatever it was. But when we discovered that verbs actually improved language and word retrieval the best, then we started moving to that. So how can you work on verbs during the day? What you can do is just think, think it or talk to yourself and use a verb like now I'm washing the dishes. Talk about what you're doing. Now I'm washing my hair. Now I'm starting my car. Now I'm writing a letter. Now I'm eating a banana, whatever it is. But all of those are like verbs or gerunds, which will really keep your brain uh, pretty sharp in the language area. <clears throat> so as far as logic and deductive reasoning goes, we've talked about speed of processing. And as far as logic and deduction goes, you can get little logic matrix problems. That's what they're called, logic matrix ones. And start at a really low level and start doing those. And that will increase your ability to um, make decisions, really look at all the possible options and then make a decision. Alrighty, um, let's move on to the next. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay. So the principles of training your brain are that there's two types of training. One is compensations and that's compensating for what you can't do, like putting notes in your phone or setting the timer on your phone or um, writing yellow sticky notes to yourself. Those are all fine, but really before you do a whole lot of compensating, you wanna to try to remediate problems. So like really working on um, training your brain through exercises and doing tasks that accompany other things. And like when you're out for a walk, even if you're doing uh, exercises like left and right, left and right, um, that will actually uh, sort of rehabilitate certain portions of the brain. It'll, it'll pull the words back, it'll be repetition, and you can add other things in. But focus on new learning, like new activities like painting, dancing, maybe swimming, cooking, things that you maybe haven't done before. Um, that you would like to try. Um, the other thing that's Marianne, a couple of questions here. Uh, sure. They want us to type out the type of puzzles for logic. Can you give me some to put on here? Um, let me think. There's actually, uh, I'm trying to think. There's three. There's three good little books of puzzles. You can get um, you can get puzzles like in bookstores, like Barnes and Noble. Places like that, I actually have specific ones, and I'd have to look and find the, the exact name title of the book for you. Okay. Um, the other thing is, does typing help? Well, typing can help, sure. And if you haven't done typing as much before, and it's a new skill that you're learning, that can be fantastic because it's fine motor and it's vision. So that would work. And how good is learning a new language? You know, that's a question I get a lot, and I used to get it from clients. I think it's actually really great for the left hemisphere, you know, for, you know, the temporal lobe, because you're doing a new activity and you're learning a language with, you know, how to say new vocabulary words and things. So I think that's a fantastic idea. 
Does moderate to heavy exercise improve brain function? Um, you know, they just came out with a study. I read it about two weeks ago that moderate exercise, mild and moderate exercise really helps brain function. But if you overexercise, it doesn't. I was really surprised at that, but that's what the latest article said that I read. Does the analog mind mapping help? And if so, in what area? I'm not sure. What's your definition of analog mind mapping? Catherine, do you want to uh, unmute? Yeah. Hi. I teach Hi. mind mapping, and I uh, analog meaning that if you're doing it by hand, you're not doing it on the computer. Right. Now, I teach that. Uh, you know, I have been teaching it for about 20 years, and I'm an avid mind mapper. I mean, every day I'm mind mapping. And I wonder how that infects, you know, works with the brain and how it can help me. You know, with sure. the brain. I th okay, so that's gr great that you brought that up because there's literature out there that shows that writing is actually better than using your computer if you're trying to get a skill, you know, embedded in your brain. And so I can't, I can't tell you specifically how it would help, except that it would probably improve word retrieval. It would help you process information in a different way. And it would definitely help, you know, if you're writing with your right hand, it'll help the left hemisphere. If you're writing with your left hand, it'll help your right hemisphere. Yeah, Theron, someone wants to know what mind mapping is. <laughs> yeah, come on, <laughs> help us out here. Well, mind mapping actually, and some people have heard, heard about it, it's called clustering um, and all. And it basically, it's, it's taking it, so people that have linear problems with taking linear notes, okay, um, can use mind mapping instead. And actually, mind mapping really works your brain so you can remember things. I can look at a mind map that I created from something I read, a book I read like five years ago, read it, and I can all, uh, tell you almost verbatim what I was thinking. What so was they want to know what it is, though. Yeah, like, it's a, if you take a piece of paper or landscape, okay, if you've got something in front of you right now, you take one landscaping and you put a circle in there and put a title. One of the new books that I'm working on uh, at right now is called Morning Thoughts, and it's taking my mapping with your morning thoughts first thing in the morning that you do and you know and you can put the date in the middle of it let's say you put the date in it um, and you can write on that in the morning and write down everything that's coming up with your brain you know things you've forgotten things you got to remember to do things that you know hey you'd like to research or you need to talk to your doctor about um, or you know coming up with in my case I use it for writing because I write every day you know lots of blogs and and all that sort of stuff. So I use it for a central topic. Uh, one of the ones now that I have uh, writing about and I'm doing research for AARP is on ear dandruff. So, you know, I put, put that ear dandruff in the center and put a circle around it. And it comes out like trees. You, you get a branch that comes out. Okay, and that's from that I go and okay. You know, I talked to my doctor. Uh, I talked to several physicians about this. And, you know, I can put their names down and then I can do another branch that comes out. I researched it on YouTube, uh, another branch. I researched it on a NIH research. I can put all this together. OK, and it, what, what it does is starts connecting the brain from one item to another and looking for it because they're saying there's no solutions for this. Okay. So, Catherine, it's like a picture is worth a thousand words, really. You got it. You can yeah. draw pictures, too. I mean, if you're taking right. and all that. But if you look at mind mapping on YouTube, there's thousands of it. Right. So I'm we recommend that you do that. It's a, it's a really cool process. I've been involved in that in the past. So. Yeah, I, I, I want to get into it after this phone call because you got me more curious about it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Marianne, uh, one of our folks that we went too fast for this person's injured brain, what's the general name of the logic puzzles? Um, they're called logic matrix puzzles. Logic matrix puzzles. And I could, I, in a minute, I could hop up and look in the file cabinet what, what the names of the books are. Okay. But and uh, another person has tinnitus. 
and has read recently, it's not a problem in the ear, but in the brain. Any ideas for getting rid of tinnitus? Um, just a, before you answer that, if you go on our braininjuryhopefoundation.org, and I will put that in uh, the chat, we actually had a whole program on tinnitus, and there is a blog. So if you hit blog, you could read a, an entire article. We had experts on tinnitus. Like Marianne, while I'm doing that, why don't you uh, just give a high level? Uh, you mean on this? The... She wants to know that it's not. It's a, is it a problem in the ear, but in the brain? Oh, on the oh, how do you get rid of tinnitus? Right, right, right. Um, tinnitus. You've probably contacted the National Tinnitus Institute in Oregon or wherever, and they basically say there's no treatments, but. I've been reading about new treatments for tinnitus. One of them is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And um, I know it's a little expensive, but that's one that they've found works. And recently I read another tinnitus article. I can't, it's not jumping into my mind right now because there's so much literature out there, but I wouldn't give up on it because I think there's some new things coming out for tinnitus. Um, I don't know if you can say it really isn't in the brain. The theory, the, the, the theory that's always been there for years is that hair cells inside your inner ear get bent a little bit. And that's what actually causes the tinnitus to occur. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Doris just put a mind map in the in the chat for you to see a picture of what that is. Thank you, Doris. Desiree says, I love to read, but the last few years I've been listening to audiobooks. Is it better for your brain to read or listen to books? Yeah. It depends on what you want to do, Desiree. Um, if you're a person that does better with auditory, you may want to divide it up a little bit and do some visual reading as well to keep that part of your brain sharp too. And that's the whole concept of the last thing on here, use the principle of reversals. Like use your, if you always lose your, use your right hand, use your left hand. If you always do auditory tasks like listening to books, you might want to spend a few hours here and there reading books to, uh, right. to get some reversals there. Uh, Samantha talked about the logic puzzles on Block Mace, and it's on the app on the Apple phone. So thank you for that. And yeah. regarding logic problems, there are apps for Apple and Android devices that have logic puzzles on the matrix. Type in logic puzzle on your app page. Um, another question for you, Marianne, is does TMS cause short-term memory loss? What's T TMS? You mean, you mean STM as short-term memory loss? Uh, I, Elizabeth, what's TMS? Or, or did you mean trans transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation? stimulation? Right, okay. right. Yes, it's something you do through a doctor's office. I wasn't sure if that was the term you guys were talking about. And they wanted to know if it causes, let me see here, if it causes um, short-term memory loss. If TMS does, I, I haven't read that it creates memory loss. I've only seen a few patients that have done it because the cost is extensive. Um, it's been used for depression, um, you know, long-term depression with various clients, but now they're finding that it uh, sometimes helps tinnitus. So Marianne, next slide. Yes. Thank you everybody for all of your active engagement here with these chats. Yeah, this is great. People always have good ideas. Um, so if you can do tasks that move up and down the neurological system or across systems, you can activate the brain. And there was a, a physician by the name of A.R. Luria, who was a Russian physician, and he studied young men that came back with like gunshot wounds to the head. And what he discovered is that he could retrain the brain by teaching them to do certain things that moved up and down the neurological system. And there's, there's words for it, like intersystemic facilitation, which is just a big word, but like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I had a friend who's a physical therapist, she still is. And one day I went to see her and she was talking to me, but she kept pushing her hands up, up and like clicking her fingers. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I don't know, but she said I was rear-ended in my car about a month ago and I can't think of any words. 
And I realized she had adapted a compensatory strategy because the fingers are right above the lips and tongue and they will help you retrieve words. And so she was doing that to actually get the words to come out. And um, so I started giving her other exercises so she could not do that because it's hard to sit around and do that all the time. But that's an example of intersystemic facilitation. So if you can't think of a word, if you actually, since it's in the left hemisphere primarily, if you tap your leg with your right hand, the word may come. So that's an example. Um, engaging in, in certain activities like rhythm, reciprocation and repetition helps stimulate the brain. So rhythm might be dancing, or even if you're walking out for a walk and you're thinking one and two and three and four, you know, and going through numbers rhythmically as you're walking. Um, reciprocation, using both sides of your body, really thinking about left and right and left and right and repeating exercises that you're doing. Even if you, let's say you did them for 20 minutes one day and then you're tired of doing them, but do them for another minute or two, a day or two later, and that repetition will really help stabilize the skill. Before we move on, we have a chat about um, long COVID and a great uh -huh. deal of, of trouble with balance and dizziness, any suggestions? Um, I can say to you that I have long COVID as well as with brain injury. I worked with a physical therapist on my balance and on my dizziness. Anything else, Marianne? Well, there are people that do, it's called dizzy balance work, and they're very specific physical therapists. I think, Joanne, it was what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So really look for, I would Google physical therapists that work on dizziness and balance. Yep. And they have a lot of exercises and tasks to really help that. The thing you wanna do if you've got balance and dizziness problems is really not push yourself beyond your limit you know, really just do sparingly, do tasks to work on that. And also somebody wrote about tapping. There's a whole lot of information about how to use this for brain health. Just a comment. And for balancing, uh, my PT person recommended working in the pool with arms stretched horizontally widespread. So we've got lots of different ideas here and um, I wish you well with that. I do know it, it you know, when you do some of the exercises, it can get better. It's just going to take yeah. getting to the right person who can help you. So let's move on and let's talk about uh, with technology. We're in a technology world and, yeah. uh, and, and, and we've moved into this in so many ways. Can you describe some of the computer assisted programs and apps to help people who are using those, these modalities? Yeah. Electronic applications are very popular now, uh, not so much for me because I'm not that great at apps, but um, let me just start out by saying, if you go into the Google bar of your computer and type in electronic applications for, and it can be like for attention or for memory or for episodic memory, and we'll talk about these things, you they will give you the applications that work for that and you can try them out i mean it was sort of magical for me when i started doing that but like prospective memory that's being able to think of a behavior you want to do and initiate the behavior there's a program called minimalist and one called priority matrix where you can prioritize then retrospective memory is remembering things from the past, things that you want to remember, like putting it into daily notes on your phone. You can uh, remember things that you need to do. These are more comp compensations, but like recalling names. Many of us have trouble recalling names, and there's this great program called Namorize. And I was looking at it, it's a dollar and 99 cents. And it will, you, like, let's say you're out for, a, you know, at a movie or something, and you meet somebody new, and their name is, say for example, Jim, and you wanna remember it, put it into your phone and then use the Namorize app and it will keep asking you over time. It'll, like every five minutes, it'll say, well, what was the name of that person? And then it'll extend the time to like 30 minutes. What was the name of the person you met? You know, da, da, da. I thought that was kind of great until it finally sort of stays in your memory and then you can get rid of it. But um, attention. This is a really important thing. There's a program called Break Time, 
that you can use. And it's based on a technique called the Pomodoro technique. And the word Pomodoro means tomato in Italian, apparently. And this Italian gentleman really figured out that you could adapt that particular technique to help the brain not be so fatigued and to be able to pay attention more. So he took his little timer, which looked like a tomato, and he would set it for 25 minutes if he had a task. And he would do the task for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break, set it for another 25 minutes, take a five minute break. Then he would make the breaks longer, like a 30 minute break or a 40 minute break. But this has been a very popular concept in neurological rehabilitation. How do you, we're not used to taking breaks in this world. We do things one thing after the, the next. Um, episodic memory is not only remembering an event, but, but really recalling where it occurred, how you felt when it occurred, all kinds of different facets of that. And there's uh, an app called Fantastical 2 that works really well on that. And then you can also use daily notes. But Marianne, any apps for working memory? That's what's worse for uh, this person who just wrote to me. Okay, working memory. So the definition of working memory, which that person probably knows, but I'll just review it for everybody. Working memory is when you're doing a task and you get interrupted and then you have to come back to the task. The best program for working memory is dual and back. That's what they actually- How do you spell that? The D-U-A-L hyphen N hyphen back, dual and back on brainscale.net. And I think you would put that in the chat. I'm doing it again for this person. Yeah. On brainscale.net. So working memory, and I've really seen that help people dramatically with working memory problems. Thank you. Okay, let's move on and talk about executive functioning and decision making uh, strategies that can help us be more efficient in our lives. Right. Okay. So being able to prioritize tasks, we've got so many things lined up on our schedules every day. Most of us do. And so if we can prioritize what really has to be done versus you know what we can put aside for a while so there's a technique called the eisenhower method and you can actually google it but eisenhower made a statement that what's important is seldom urgent and what is urgent is seldom important and it seems sort of uh paradoxical to me but apparently he listed his tasks on a daily basis as they, or as they came up and Priority one tasks would be things that were both urgent and important. Like say, for example, um, you had to move money from one bank account to another, or you would overdraw your account. That would be maybe urgent and important, the way that they take things out of our bank accounts immediately now. So that's, you know, that's an important uh, kind of task to figure out. Priority two are tasks that are important but not urgent. Like say, for example, if you have to call and make a dentist appointment or you need to go and get blood work for your doctor or whatever it is, um, that's important, but maybe doesn't have to be done that day or within the week. Priority three are tasks that are urgent, but not important. Like remembering your granddaughter's birthday or you know something like that. It's, it's kind of urgent that you recall it but it's not necessarily important. So you put it on your list. They say to delegate it, list or delegate it, but it might be something you'd wanna remember within the next couple of weeks. And then priority four are things that aren't urgent or important. And I think we all make so many lists that we might need to really revisit is the task and ask yourself, is that really important or not? So Miriam, let's take the next five or six minutes and uh, circle back to sleep and fatigue and talk about the causes for sleep problems and possible treatments. Right. So sleep and fatigue goes along with most neurological problems as well as when we age. Um, as you've noticed in the literature, if you've been paying attention to what's coming out, sleep is now considered to be as important as diet and exercise. And people who don't sleep well have what are called sleep-wake disturbances. 
And a study uh, in the Journal of Sleep Medicine, I think, yes, uh, reported that if you get an adequate amount of sleep, like seven hours at least of sleep a night, you can add years to your life. And it can also improve your heart health, which is critical for all of us. Harvard did a study and discovered that if people slept less than seven hours a night, that it impacted their ability to encode memories. And so that's another way that you can kind of work on improving your memory. So sleep is, is very important. Uh, let's do the next slide. The causes of sleep can be many things. Biochemical changes, like if your melatonin production changes, like in individuals with traumatic brain injury, they've discovered that they produce 42% less mel melatonin over the course of the day than normal folks. And so if you can have those things looked at, it, you know, it might be helpful. Uh, headaches and centralized pain, like migraines, things like that, grinding your teeth, that can wake you up at four to five in the morning and that'll interrupt your sleep. And then another category is, are called uh, sleep architecture changes. And that's the, the organization and cyclical patterns of normal sleeping. And mild traumatic brain injuries, say for example, they spend much more time in stage one and stage two, which is light sleep and less time in three to four. Okay, next slide. And so if you look, begin to look at brainwave patterns and, you know, biochemical changes like melatonin and things like that, you can oftentimes find the cause. Brainwave patterns can be associated with, with um, poor sleep. So like beta and gamma are very high brainwave patterns. And in post-traumatic patients who have had an accident or something like that, a lot of times the brainwave patterns become altered. It's a biochemical injury a lot of times. And like an electrical type injury where the brain is staying more in theta, which is the state right before sleep, rather than falling down deeply into delta, you can actually uh, use EEG neurofeedback sometimes to alter your brain waves by learning to suppress. You can, they, they can put little electrodes on the brain and then you can surface electrodes and then you can watch the screen and learn to suppress those patterns. And if you do it enough, then the alpha will begin to come up and then the beta. And then the, the belief is if you can be wide awake during the day, you can go into sleep patterns. What more. type of expert do you go to to do that? You would go to someone who was certified in neurofeedback, EEG neurofeedback, and you'd find it through uh, the Biofeedback Certification Institute of America. Okay, thank you. Certain people. Yeah. Uh, other problems that affect sleep, of course, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, uh, restless leg movements, things like that. Okay, Joanne, pop to the next slide. So the best way to diagnose sleep problems is through the gold standard, which is polysomnography, where you actually go and they hook you up and they look at your brain waves while you sleep, your oxygen levels in your blood, your heart rate and breathing, eye and leg movements and things like that. And then they can really try to get a good diagnosis about what's causing sleep problems. Sometimes we try to address it through a million different ways. Whereas if we just went and had test, a test done, you know, we might figure it out. And you can go to your doctor and ask them, uh, tell them your symptoms and ask them if they would uh, refer you for a sleep study. Sure. And there is a, uh, many doctors now are using different, simpler things like what's called actigraphy, where you put a wristband on and it records movements and things like that. But um really getting polysomnography is the best idea so marianne we're down to our last five minutes so okay. well maybe people have questions or they wanna, well there's some good let's, slides here i'm going to just okay uh, yeah let's get into talk, treatments yeah let's not talk about sleep hygiene everybody knows you have to have a dark room and right temperature and things like that um and i want to answer that one about sleep apnea but Someone had asked about the light therapy, blue light therapy. So I want to talk about that a little bit. 
um, there was a guy by the name of Wu, W-U, and in 2018, he did a study on blue light therapy. And then another gentleman by the name of Sinclair did a study on blue light therapy where he did traumatic brain injury individuals. And what he found is if they use blue light therapy for 45 minutes a day, and you know, you can buy blue lights at your hardware store. So it isn't like you have to do something really, really costly, but four weeks, 45 minutes a day, and you have to do it in the morning because it's a stimulator. And that this reduced fatigue and daytime sleepiness and it improved your sleep patterns better than actually um, other kinds of medications. So that's a pretty important concept. Marianne, our Fitbit watch is good for measuring sleep. We just had a question about that. I don't know, really. I used a Fitbit and I thought it was pretty, pretty accurate. Some people don't. I now have an Apple watch and I haven't started measuring my sleep patterns, but I felt like the Fitbit was pretty on target. Okay. You know, yeah. Let's go to the next slide because there's one more concept and I know we're getting so we're going to skip the chiropractic and the yeah skip this and I want to do the very last thing on here before we end on warm foot baths. This was is actually very simple, but it's something that has been found to really work a group of visiting nurses went into the homes of individuals and they um, had people put their feet in a warm foot bath. And these were people who had actually had a neurological insult, like a brain injury, and they were pretty far post injury. So they didn't think anything would help their sleep, but they put them in a warm foot bath of 105 degrees um, for 30 minutes, one to two hours prior to sleep. And it's, it decreased how long it took people to go to sleep and they stayed asleep much longer and felt much more rested. And what the theory was at the end is that you have warm, warm, something warm tracking neurons in the bottom of your feet. And if you stimulate them, it actually causes relaxation. And you can, um, you know, in parts of the brain and you can actually sleep better. So I think that's kind of important. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. <laughs> Uh, we are so grateful that all 130 of you have stayed with us and uh, you've learned a plethora of a great amount of information from Dr. Marianne Keatley. Um, thank, this, is really, uh, this, this has been recorded today, so I encourage you to watch it again. For those of you, I know people were writing that sometimes we're, it, you know, we, we're, we're, not, we're making an effort not to go too quickly. Uh, for those of you in terms of your own memories, uh, watch it again. And each time you'll see something like this, you'll get to um, glean some more information. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you so much, uh, LLI Nova and AARP for inviting us as guests. And we appreciate all of you being here and sharing your time with us. And thanks again, Dr. Keeley. Sure. I wanted to make one last comment. I looked up the study on the Brookings Institute. And before it was that they said that there that these were um, averages that they thought, but then I looked up the current study that they did, and they said that 16 million people of working age are out of work because of COVID now, which makes much more sense. Okay, well, thank you for doing that. And yeah. we're getting lots of great comments about an excellent presentation. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn this back to you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Joanne and Marianne, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think that uh, Derek Malis has one more announcement to make concerning tomorrow's business meeting for LLI Nova. So, Derek. Great. Th thank you, Steve. Uh, I, I want to second the thank yous to uh, Marianne and to Joanne for this wonderful presentation. Uh, also to uh, Trudy uh, and to the AARP members for joining us. It's a terrific session. Uh, just wanted to repeat that uh, we would welcome any of the AARP members attending to check out, check us out at LLINova.org. Uh, I had talked about our programs and things. We'd love to have uh, you uh, uh, new members join us. Uh, and I do want to mention we have our monthly forum tomorrow. Uh, for current members of LLI, I would urge you to arrive by 9.15 because we will... Uh, 
uh, excuse me, by 945, because we'll have uh, election of officers, a brief uh, financial review, and we'll be presenting our FY 2024 budget. But the actual forum will start at 1015 tomorrow. Dr. Diane Mucci, who is the provost at NOVA, will be our uh, presenter. Everyone is welcome to that. Uh, the location is at the Little River United Church of Christ. I actually don't have the address, but it's uh, on the north side of Little River Turnpike, immediately north of the Annandale Nova campus. Plenty of parking. Uh, we invite uh, ARP members to join us. Uh, and I certainly would like to ask our LLI members to come by 945 so that you can vote uh, uh, for our new slate of officers. So. Again, thank you very much, uh, Joanne and Marianne, and to AARP. And uh, with that, I guess we're done. <laughs>